Now, if you remember from yesterday, we were talking about 10,000 people making sure our fighting men had the ammunition they need to win this war. The rail body and all of the uh, raw materials, so to speak, and left then again later on when in the form of shells assembled and ready to go. Around 20 million rounds of ammunition of the various types per year. I know they made some bombs up to at least 250 pound bombs. With orders to fill, there are no breaks. And of course, when it did run, it ran 24 hours a day. The, the ammunition that was produced at the Eliopolis plant, I think went to all theaters of the war. And um, we had the, the big push in Europe, particularly towards the end with the, the Battle of the Bulge in 1944 and uh, getting things wrapped up there. But of course, the Pacific was still uh, ongoing too. But it was a big contribution. And the people at the plant took everything very seriously that they were contributing to end the war. Now, we're fairly certain that the Iliopolis ammunition was used at the Battle of the Bulge. That's an, a neat story that they would put their, uh, some information on a note and send it in with the uh, crates of ammunition and get some response back eventually from the soldiers that found those notes. There was a Battle of the Bulge reference in, which tied into the putting little cards in with the ammunition. Uh, and and there was, uh, that was where some of that ammunition went that got a response from the soldiers. But eventually it all came to an end. On, uh, I believe it was August the 6th, shortly after the, the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, they cut back, uh, they laid off the first 1,500 people. A week later, they got an order to stop delivering ammunition. We won the war. So hopefully uh, uh, the, they served all the brave men that were over there when they hope our shells did the things they should have done, and let's hope they did. But like I say, we won the war. What more can you say? And just like that, the plant shut its doors. And when the war was over, Iliopolis went back to being little old Iliopolis. And what's left after over 70 years are merely skeletons of a massive complex that played a huge part in winning World War II. But most notably are these bunkers. So they designed these enclosures such that their shape was that the explosion would be primarily upward. And some of them found a new purpose. I knocked the ends out of mine and got them so I store machinery and hay in them. It'll, they'll hold 80 or 82 big round bales. And one of these bunkers still has material in it that dates back to the end of the war. Yeah, there's boxes in there that's never been opened from Canada. Well, i tell you what that was. Hunter Moody had a bunch of airplane engines uh, uh, shipped down here, surplus out of Canada after the war. You know, he flew for the Hunter, uh, the RCAF Ferry, Ferry Command, and he stored them out there. So I bet that's where that came from. Much of the land is back to its original state, but a few remnants remain to remind us of what once was and hopefully will never be again. It changed things. There's no doubt about it. Time marches on. It's a circle of life. The Iliopolis Library has a large scrapbook of news articles regarding the plant, as well as a thesis written by B. David McCarthy, with extensive, much more detailed information regarding the plant's history. One of these days, you know, nobody's going to know anything about it. It's going to say, what was this? And people at the time will have no idea. So anything we can, like I say, preserve of it, we need to do. Through my lens in Iliopolis, this is Steve Nichols, WAND.